Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining our virtual workshop here with the AAAS committee, LPRISD committee on sky glow and satellite swarms. Uh, we wanted to update you on the state of affairs and give you a chance to ask us some questions about the situation, both on the ground and in low earth orbit. Um, Julie, next slide, please. So as a quick intro, uh, we're in kind of a, a watershed moment for the source of our data, both from the ground and in space. About uh, 20, 25 years ago, rather abruptly, um, advances in LED technology uh, made LEDs viable for outdoor lighting and communities for good reasons rapidly started adopting them, mostly fairly high temperature white LEDs. And it was after the fact that we began to understand some of the uh, side effects of, of that, uh, including vastly increased lumen for lumen sky glow, as well as environmental and even human health impacts. And we're sort of in reactive mode to the rapid growth, growth of ground-based sky glow. Now the same thing is happening in orbit with an abrupt advance in technology that is making low earth orbit accessible, not just to large federal agencies like NASA, but nimble companies from the private sector like SpaceX. And the result is a radical transformation of the population and density uh, and variety of objects in orbit. Now, all of us on this call and around the world use space every day for multiple purposes, whether navigation, communication, understanding what the weather is going to be, but it is also the source of astronomical data and there is significant impacts and threats to our field. So today we're going to cover this in three parts. Several members of the LPRISD committee are here to give you some updates on different areas relevant to the topic. We'll start with the, the big topic on everyone's mind, satellite constellations. Then we'll move on to ground-based light pollution, radio intercurrents, space debris, and also a discussion of broader community engagement and policy, which are areas of emphasis that have emerged in our radar recently. Then we'll talk a little bit about how things you can do and how you can advocate as members of the astronomical community regarding this issue. And we'll wrap up with some Q&A at the end. Uh, to be respectful of everybody's time, we'll keep it strictly to 90 minutes and conclude at noon uh, Pacific and 3 p.m. Eastern. So with that, thanks for joining us. On behalf of all of us, I'm Jeff Hall from Lowell Observatory, Chair of the Committee, and I'm now gonna pass it off to several of our excellent committee members, starting with Pat Seitzer uh, to give everybody the state of affairs on satellite constellation. So Pat, over to you. Thank you. Um, good afternoon or good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Pat Seitzer. I'm from the University of Michigan Astronomy Department. I'm a research professor emeritus, and my specialty is optical observations of space debris. So today, I'd just like to give you a brief update on what's happening in low Earth orbit today, starting with existing constellations under construction, a few planned constellations. This list is not exhaustive. And finally, a recent refereed paper discussing solar power from space recent developments. So if I can go to the next slide, please. So the the elephant in the room is the SpaceX Starlink genera Generation 1. The goal is 4,408 satellites in orbit. It was their launch in May 2019, which uh, alerted us all to the problem that this is going to pose. So far, they have launched 2,333. 221 have re-entered. There's 212 in orbit, and 2092 of those are transmitting positions. So they have about 50% of the constellation launched. If you want a detailed description of which satellite is operational and which one's not, I refer you to Jonathan McDowell's excellent website. They have a goal of Starlink's generation two. Uh, this would be a second generation of Starlinks, also in low Earth orbit. And the goal here is 29,988 satellites. It's pending before the FCC approval. There is major industry opposition from almost everyone in the satellite field to that generation two. The SpaceX proposes to launch both Gen 2 and Gen 2 simultaneously for a total of over 34,000 satellites uh, in orbit and operational. So Julie, if I can go to the next slide, please. So this shows you the altitude distribution as of last night of 2092 Starlink satellites. The operational altitude is near 550. There's a group near 330 to 340, which is in the process of uh, orbit raising and will eventually go to 550. 
So that's the distribution now. You know, the goal of all of these things was to keep the magnitudes below seventh magnitude. So the next uh, slide, Julie, shows uh, MMT9 observations of visor sat at 550 kilometer altitude. There are 15 passes between 2020, August 23rd and 2021, July 2nd, December 2nd. And here we wait, we use the public TLEs. Uh, when they reach 550, I wait one week for them to reach the proper attitude and the proper shape. Remember that they shape shift from an open book to a knife edge or from an open book to uh, from a flat to a rectangular configuration. And the goal is seventh magnitude here. Well, they're pretty good, but out of 15 passes, two of the passes have magnitudes between three and a half and four and a half magnitudes. And that's critically dependent on the viewing geometry. So I would say there is still some work there to be done. So let me go to the next slide, please. Uh, one web, they've launched 428. One has failed at 1200 kilometers. And that's a target for possible active debris removal since the natural decay time is many, many centuries, more than 500 years for that satellite to decay naturally. It exceeds the 25 year rule by an order of magnitude. And the initial goal is 648 satellites at 1200 kilometers. If you've been following the news, they were supposed to have a launch several weeks ago from Russia. Uh, from another launch of 32 satellites that was suspended. Uh, the payload, the satellites are still in Russia and they will not be launching from Russia. The plan is to resume later this year on SpaceX uh, rockets. So um, SpaceX basically has the, the market cornered. Um, the next slide, please, shows you the altitude distribution. They're at 1200. Uh, one of the there's a group at 600, which is in the process of being orbit raised to their final operational altitude at 1200 kilometers. Um, let's if I can have the next slide, please. So spacetrack.org, which is the official front end of the US Air Force catalog, which is the public catalog that the US Air Force releases. So last night, uh, this was the space scoreboard. Active payloads were 5,600. Everything else is debris. Okay, out of that 44,300 objects, only 5,600 are active payloads. The Starlinks plus one web are 45% of all active satellites. Let me just repeat that. Starlinks plus one web are 45% of all of the active satellites in orbit today. That is a stunning number. Starlinks are alone are over 35%. So anyway, so that's where we are with the current constellations that are being launched. The next slide, please. Um, there are planned constellations. This is a very small sample. Amazon Kuiper will launch two experimental satellites later this year, and they have requested optical observations for comparison of apparent brightness between the two. They will have slightly different architectures. China has planned a 13,000 satellite constellation. Six prototype satellites were launched on March 5th. The observations there are highly desirable. So if you have access to a telescope and can track these, we'd love to see the observations. The NORAD IDs are 51946 to 51951, and they are in the public catalog. A company called eSpace, which was founded by Greg Weiler, who founded OneWeb, has a planned constellation of 100,000 small satellites in LEO. Three test satellites are due to be launched in the second quarter of this year, and I don't have any further details at this time. But this is just a small subset of the planned constellations. Uh, with that, if I can go to the next slide, please. So what's becoming apparent is it's not just internet constellations that astronomers need to worry about. And this is a picture of a solar farm array up on the University of Michigan North Campus. But these panels are useful only in daytime. But what if you had orbiting mirrors that could illuminate them at nighttime? And next slide, please. And that's what's seriously been proposed in a uh, recent peer-reviewed paper in Acta Astronautica entitled Enhancing Terrestrial Solar Power Using Orbital Solar Reflectors. So they're basically giant mirrors in space. This is not a new idea. It goes back to Hermann Oberth 100 years or more. 
It's not a conventional solar power satellite, which has, you're beaming the power to the ground via microwave. It's just a giant flat mirror. And reflect the sunlight to existing solar farms on ground, they can generate power as long as the satellite is in twilight, as in sunlight. Well, if you were to launch these things at 800 kilometers, which was one part of the study, um, that's well past astronomical twilight that you're putting sun uh, on the ground. And this was the paper there, and it was supported by a two and a half million euro grant from the European Research Council. So this is not something to be uh, laughed out of, out of hand. Um, so they are coming. If I can have the next slide, please. Something to consider, which the authors of this paper did not, is that the site conditions for solar farms are very, very similar to astronomical observatories. Clear weather, low extinction. If you've been to either Las Campanas or uh, La Silla recently, on the access road, you drive past a large solar farm that powers the Santiago Metro. You can see the Santiago Metro sign there. Um, and so uh, folks, I think this is potentially more serious um, than you can think. Remember that this proposal uses existing ground infrastructure, okay? You don't have to build anything new on the ground. This just extends their use well past sunset. It's green power, it's technically feasible, and I predict we will see prototypes launched very soon. And uh, with that optimistic note, I return it to you, Jeff. I think uh, I'm next. Thank you very much, Pat. I, I'm James Lowenthal, speaking to you from my office at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, until the, the launch of Starlinks that uh, Pat just told us about uh, in May of 2019, our committee, the Light Pollution Radio Interference Space Debris Committee, was mostly focused on those three things, and then among those, mostly on light pollution. And that has really taken a back seat uh, during this sort of crisis management mode we've been in for the last several years. Uh, but light pollution continues to brew as a serious problem. We've all seen these pictures of the United States or the whole world from space. Of course, we know that that's wasted light. Uh, we can see the cities of Phoenix and Tucson here, uh, both on the left from space, and of course, on the right from, from Kitt Peak. There's uh, the, the light dome of the city of Phoenix uh, over 200 kilometers away. Uh, it continues to be a, a, a good dark site, but it's, it's not getting any better. Next slide, please, Julie. Thank you. This is a map that I highly recommend to everybody, uh, lightpollutionmap.info. If you haven't gone there, go there now. Make sure you bookmark this. You will use it again and again. Uh, every talk I give to every group about light pollution, I bring up this map and I, you can zoom in on any part of the world and see what the uh, sky brightness is. Uh, estimated from a combination of downward looking satellites and, uh, and sky quality meters on the ground. And any part of the world, you can click and, and pull up a, a chart like this, which is for as close to Kitt Peak as I could navigate with my cursor on the zoomed out map. And you can see what the numbers are. For example, the SQM number highlighted there shows us the sky brightness in magnitudes per square arc second, astronomers units, 21.93, pretty darn good, pretty close to nominal 22, mags per square arc second of uh, pristine dark sky. Or you can see that number ratio, which is the, uh, the, the fraction additional uh, uh, artificial sky glow added to natural. So in this case, um, uh, 0.06 is, or 0.07 is fantastic, just 7% brighter than natural. Bortle class two out of nine, where one is the best. Uh, so I highly recommend this, uh, this chart. Of course, the bad news comes in the next picture, Julie. Uh, which um, shows us the trends with time. Uh, here are a couple of, uh, of uh, highly cited papers from our, our colleagues who are part astronomers, uh, part atmospheric scientists, part light pollution uh, scholars who are publishing in the scientific literature about the, uh, the state of the night sky. On the left, a paper from Chris Paiba, uh, who works in Germany, uh, showing that, uh, that light pollution has been growing globally on, on average 2% per year, double the rate of population growth. In other words, all of us are using more light per capita every year. And you see the red areas here are the most uh, quickly growing uh, areas, both in, in luminance and in, in area. On the right, a more recent paper uh, by Sanchez and Miguel showing again, the, the long-term growth of light pollution, uh, which, are, which are the data points 
uh, in power emitted as a function of, of time. Uh, but it's key to note that uh, those data points are from downward looking satellites that are mostly insensitive to blue light, the blue light that is produced by new LED lights. And the higher the color temperature, the, uh, the CCT of the light, the more blue it is, the more that's being missed. So the shaded regions show how much brighter the night sky actually is that's missed by this downward facing satellites. If all the, the growth in, uh, in LED lights that we've seen in the last couple of years is from either 3000K lights, which have a lot of blue, a lot more than the lights they're replacing, or even worse, 4000K lights, which have even more blue. Uh, this implies that in fact, light pollution has gotten as bad as 400% worse globally since 1992. Next slide, please. How does all this happen? Well, it's as Jeff said at the beginning, it's the LED revolution. LEDs are cheap, they last a long time, they're highly efficient. Uh, they're, uh, it seems like a win-win for cities and towns. And it's a classic case of the Jevons paradox. We have uh, technology that's more efficient. Instead of using less, we actually wind up using the same amount of resource, but in this case, producing more light. So here's the street light on my house, on, uh, outside my house on my street. Um, uh, before, on the left, the pretty well shielded high pressure sodium light it had been there probably 50 years. And if you click once, you'll see the new light that got installed just a couple of years ago. Same camera, same lens, same settings. Uh, and you can see with this new LED light, we've got much more glare. Uh, you can't see so clearly, but there's much more blue. It's 3000 K. Uh, so the blue light has gone up about a factor of two. The glare has definitely gone up. The light pollution, we had a chance to get it right. And unfortunately the city made the wrong choice. Uh, and this is being repeated again and again and again across the state, across the country, around the world. The next slide, please. There have been four major conferences in the last two years focused on, uh, on satellite mega constellations and light pollution. Um, the, uh, the one I wanna tell you about right now is an international one called Dark and Quiet Skies, uh, which was hosted by the International Astronomical Union and commissioned by the, the committee of the United Nations that is relevant in this case, that's the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. And a component of this uh, Dark and Quiet Skies uh, workshop pair, one in 2021 and 2021, a component of it was focused on artificial light at night. Uh, so we had an ALAN working group at Dark and Quiet Skies 2 last year. We produced a, a document that had these three parts, a policy summary, uh, a set of, of, uh, of existing regulations and proposed regulations, uh, and technical guidance. All of this uh, submitted to uh, UN COPUS with the hope that they would be able to uh, uh, adopt it and promulgate it to their member nations. Uh, and it included recommendations like the following. These are the overarching recommendations we made to the UN then. Uh, one, uh, endorse the goal of reducing artificial light at night. Yes, UN COPUS is most, mostly concerned with satellites, but we made a strong case that ground-based light pollution affects that very much. Two, endorse the policy frameworks uh, for controlling ALAN that we're proposing, specifically caps on the total amount of light that can be uh, emitted in a particular region, something that does not really exist yet in our sphere, but it does exist for air quality, water quality. So there are models out there. And three, coordinate with other United Nations level agencies like the World Health Organization, uh, since health is affected by light pollution. The United Nations Environmental Program, uh, uh, the United Nations Declaration for the Rights of Indigenous Persons, and the uh, International Union for the Conservation of Nature. We strongly recommend that uh, all nations consider adopting these five simple motherhood and apple pie uh, principles for responsible outdoor lighting that were uh, assembled by the International Dark Sky Association and the Illuminating Engineering Society. Julie, the next slide, please. Finally, what can you do? And what is our committee doing? Our committee is gonna help you do all of these things. So the, the, um, I am leading the light pollution section, the subcommittee of uh, LPRISD. And we recommend that all astronomers in the AAS do these things and we wanna help you do them. Join the IDA. They are the go-to organization here, but they need our help. Um, get local, invest in for a few hundred dollars, a sky quality meter like the one you see on the upper left, 
uh, connect it to the internet. So you have a constant 24 seven stream of data that you can use to uh, argue for uh, improving light, uh, lighting in your area. Give talks, get engaged with local environmental groups, neighborhood groups, public health groups. They are gonna be eager to hear from you about the effect of light pollution on those issues. Um, please contact your colleagues if you're at a university or a college, your colleagues in environmental studies, outside of astronomy, urban planning, architecture, geography, they will care about these issues. Uh, lighting affects all of their issues very much and they have a lot of reach. They are gonna reach students and other colleagues. Talk to your local, state, and national representatives. We'll help you do that. We'll help give you the, the tools you need to, to make cogent arguments. And finally, uh, here's a simple thing. Just get your town or your college or your university to adopt the IES IDA five principles of out, responsible outdoor lighting. It's a great beginning of a conversation. It's so easy for them to do it. It doesn't cost them anything, but it will begin that, that very important education process. With that, uh, thank you very much. And I will now turn it over uh, to Harvey List to tell you about the RI side of LPRISD. Uh, thanks, James. And uh, welcome everyone who's attending today. So I'm gonna to talk about what I call the spectrum landscape for radio astronomy. And in the next slide, I'm gonna start with a bit of history to try to explain where things come from. So this text that you're not supposed to read is the tip of an iceberg that was agenda item 1.6 at the previous uh, World Radio Conference that concluded in 2019. And the question was whether or not to allow non-GSO satellites to operate in what's called V-band, 37 and a half to 42 and a half gigahertz and 47 to 51 gigahertz along with geosynchronous. And it wasn't an agenda item that made big waves. In fact, none of the constellation operators that were prepared to, uh, to launch these things that were contemplating it actually described constellations. They, they were able to satisfy most services um, without doing that. So there was very little discussion of the actual constellations. The protections for radio astronomy were already written into the radio regulations before this, so they were not in question. But two years later in the United States, the next slide shows you what happened, right? There was an FCC processing round that concluded last November and uh, companies ask the FCC for permission to launch about 40,000 new broadband satellites in the V-band. And this includes many nations in, uh, in the world. There will be many more satellites than actually applied for permission to operate in the US. And you know, around the same time that this happened, and this is a direct result of agenda item 1.6 at the World Radio Conference that was implemented by the FCC two years later, you know, uh, something that that Pat mentioned, the, the constellation, the filing from Rwanda actually for a constellation of 327,320 satellites. And although this seems like a completely crazy idea, um, the, the man behind it is Greg Weiler who founded OneWeb. And although he eventually lost control of OneWeb, he has a, a long history of innovation in the space industry. So this is not something that can be easily dismissed. Um, next slide, please. Well, you know, it's, it's, it's just an article of faith in the satellite industry that you're gonna go bankrupt at some point. Everybody is afraid of going bankrupt at some point. Many of the companies that are still operating have gone through bankruptcy. It's just a life, it's, it's, it's just a, a, a part of the life cycle of many of these companies. And the only reason that I'm actually showing this is the box at the bottom, because Elon Musk is now arguing that only the 30,000 plus satellite version of Starlink is viable. And those of you who noticed this this week saw that uh, SpaceX just raised its prices substantially for both the ground station and for the, uh, the, monthly, the monthly subscription rate. Well, so there, there is a life cycle in satellites and paying attention to what goes on with the works uh, sort of tells you how the industry is evolving. So let's ask now, there's another work going on, which is work 23. What are the issues that are, uh, that are in play now. So the next slide, please, Julie. So this is the work 23 agenda items that I'm following and other radio astronomers are following. And the thing to notice about this is that satellites are just not a big deal here. Um, most of the issues that are in play now are uh, terrestrial spectrum rather than space. So there's uh, agenda item 1.2, which is cell phones. That's a perpetual thing. They're always looking for more spectrum. But the next few are um, 
issues where where uh, frequencies that are that are used on the ground or near the ground are are being pushed to higher elevations. So there's an agenda item 1.4, which is uh, cell phone base stations on high altitude platforms at 20 kilometers. Right, you're always told to turn off your cell phone while you're in flight because you're going to cause dropped calls on the ground. I've never seen an agenda item that had more incompatibilities than this Hibs, uh, which is the IMT base stations on HAPS at 20 kilometers is showing. Uh, 1.6 is communication for suborbital vehicles. What, what happens is that when, when one of these uh, billionaires goes into space to get plastic astronaut wings, they just launch this thing into space using the same avionics on the uh, space vehicle or the subspace vehicle, the suborbital vehicle that they use in flight because it makes it more convenient when, uh, when the thing is actually launched to be able to communicate with other traffic in the vicinity. It's, it's highly forbidden actually in terms of the actual spectrum allocations that don't allow things uh, on the ground to be used in space, but they're sort of hoping that this will just be swept under the rug and it will, uh, as an existing practices, it will continue. Uh, there's UAV, which is drones in segregated and non-segregated airspace using frequencies that previously we only saw on the ground. Um, there's this thing called non-safety aeronautical mobile communications, which is an in-air mesh network for wireless broadband on, in the air, the AAS um, filed in this issue, uh, in, a, in a related issue for 70, 80, 90 gigahertz. It's very serious when, when aircraft are starting to use frequencies that previously we had coordinated away on the ground. Um, and so there's a theme to this work, which is flying frequencies whose potential interference we had coordinated away, away on the ground by regulation and very much not satellite business actually. So the next slide, it's hard to summarize everything that's going on. Um, there is plenty of stuff going on with satellites. Uh, there are companies that want satellites to talk directly to your cell phone. The orbiting X-band radars that are so powerful and provided so much information have proliferated in terms of numbers by a factor of roughly 100, where these things were previously flagship missions of big space agencies now startups are getting in launching fleets of dozens of these things where the space agencies only had one or two. Um, $100 million was announced to have gone to Caltech for solar power satellites of the kind that convert solar power energy to microwaves and then beam it back down to the ground. It's quite lethal levels. It's extremely dangerous for radio astronomy spectrum, for spectrum, for infrared brightness of the sky and, and in many other respects. This is, this is an idea that we fight against, we've been fighting against it since 1981. It just never seems to go away. There's some good news. Uh, IUCAF and the European Space Agency signed an agreement whereby the successor to the 94 gigahertz CloudSat radar will mute itself over our telescopes. And for further, for further reading, I've got a couple of uh, references at the bottom. There's, there's no bottom line to this. It's simply ongoing. It's, a, it's, it's technology. Uh, expanding in ways that are very hard to track. And from a moment to moment basis, we simply try to keep up. It's, I feel like a cork bobbing on the ocean. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Harvey. Um, so I'm just gonna say a few words on space debris. And the largest space debris event since 2009 was the deliberate destruction of the Russian satellite Cosmos 1408 on November 15, 2021. And over 1,500 fragments larger than 10 centimeters were created. This is the largest debris event in over 14 years, 13 years. So it's very significant. I had thought that everybody had learned their lessons after the Iridium Cosmos collision in 2009 and the Feng Yong 1C ASAT test in 2007, but apparently not. Next slide, please. This shows you what's called a Gabbard diagram for 1,164 Cosmos fragments, which were in the catalog as of last night. And what this shows you, each particle or each fragment has two uh, points in this plot. It has an apogee point and it has a perigee point. I'm also showing you the Hubble Space Telescope altitude which is just above where Cosmos 1408 was. Things at the lower left, there are 88 uh, minutes period, 
will be re-entering very quickly. Notice that for the majority of these things, the perigee, the closest point to the Earth, is not uh, changing much. But objects get scattered into higher orbits, apogee, um, and thus they represent a danger to things like Hubble Space Telescope. Next slide, please. So here's just a, a, a drawing or a, an image of uh, well, how the various orbits are. Cosmos 1408 and the red dots and the white dots uh, are shown there. And then the relative orbits, which are completely different inclinations of the International Space Station and the Hubble Space Telescope. So fortunately for us, these orbits are not intersecting that often. Uh, next slide. Uh, this shows you the size distribution uh, from cumulative, from radar observations. This is from the latest edition of the NASA Orbital Debris Quarterly Newsletter, which came out just a few days ago, uh, in terms of meters and the cumulative number down as well, is estimated to be well over 1 million pieces down to 0 0.001 meters. That's a significant number. Um, so these things do generate a lot of, of, of uh, material, even if it's only 1,500 pieces larger than, say, 10 centimeters, which is what the radars um, generally can track. And Uh, next slide. Can someone hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. There we go. Okay. I think she had a computer delay. Okay, good. So this shows, uh, this is a familiar top uh, plot, which is plotted every couple of months in the NASA Orbital Debris Quarterly Newsletter. This is the latest one as of the 1st of March. The top curve shows the total number of objects which are currently tracked on orbit. And you can see the three boosts are the Fengyang 1C ASAT test back in 2007, the Iridium Cosmos collision in 2009, and now the Cosmos 1408 ASAT test last November. If you look at the next curve down where one, two, and three are marked, you can see this is just the fragmentation events, and you can see that there's a slight downturn as those objects which are in low perigee re-enter quickly. But I want to emphasize one thing. Notice the curve of satellites which in this case, I've given full credit to SpaceX and Starlinks, but I will also have to give credit to OneWeb in a revised edition of this plot. Notice that most of the increase in the top curve is not from this space debris event, it's from the launch of active satellites, Starlinks, OneWebs, and hundreds of other CubeSats and the like. So it's, a, it's, it's difficult. ASAT tests are really bad. You shouldn't do them under any circumstance because eventually you will, I consider them to be like murder-suicide packs. You may take out your opponent, but eventually you will kill yourself with the debris field that you have generated. But a significant fraction of the growth of objects in low Earth orbit is now coming from active satellites. And with that, I will turn it over to Arpana. Hello, everybody. My name is Aparna Venkatesan. I'm a cosmologist at the University of San Francisco, and it has been the privilege of my career to work with the wonderful, smart people you are hearing from today. So I'm here to share a bit about this committee's work on community engagement, which is a relatively new charge of this committee. And initially, we began by grouping a lot of issues in constituencies that were not addressed by the open charge of the our acronym LPRINSD. But we have grown significantly in recent months so that we have begun to think of community engagement as the undulating landscape and seascape connecting the individual islands of the issues we'll hear about today because after all, space is our shared ancestor and the broadest constituency in space is all of humanity and really all ecological systems. So the ideas, the mistakes, the lessons learned, the framework, the policies that we take to low earth orbits and that we take away from low earth orbits 
will be what we take with us to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Um, before I jump into the main part of my presentation, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the ancestral homelands uh, where I live and work, uh, the Coast Miwok and Ohlone, and the traditional custodians of the land where each of you are. Thank you, Julie. Next slide. I know we all know that we are at an existential crossroads currently, both as a planet, whether with human events, climate events, ecological events, or otherwise. And in the middle of all our doom scrolling, it's hard to see the opportunity here, which is to reimagine how we do science and scientific exploration. And through our collective work in this committee, I've written out a few points. I will not read all of them, but I want to amplify once more that the skies and space belong to and impact all people, indeed all ecosystems of life that depend on the night sky and on each other. The broadest constituency in your earth space is humanity. And when so much is done in space in the name of communities, we need to closely examine and closely ask about the impacts on communities from these choices. The duty to consult communities is becoming more urgent than ever, given everything that's being done in their name. And we need to encourage and invite integrative scientific cultural worldviews as we approach our shared skies together. And I will return to this point of viewing the sky as part of the environment. Next slide, please. So what have we, this committee, uh, been doing about this? People have already mentioned a series of meetings, SATCON and SATCON 2, which happened last summer, also the Dark and Quiet Skies series of workshops. Um, and I want to particularly emphasize that in SATCON 2, we had a community engagement working group which was really a first because we went beyond just industry agencies and professional astronomers. We had 25 members in all time zones across the world. And I've written out here a few of our constituencies in this working group while fully acknowledging that many of these need to stand on their own, uh, including sovereign indigenous nations and concerns from tribal communities. We are doing all of these constituencies a disservice by folding them in into the miscellaneous um, of community engagement. Nevertheless, we needed to start somewhere. So what we've been doing this last year is to amplify the reports that came out of these workshops through many, and gratitude to the AAS here, through many presentations to branches of the US federal government, national and international agencies, and now the brand new IEU Center to address interference from satellite constellations, which is giving us and community engagement a global stage. The premise here is that all of us need to come together to co-create a shared ethical sustainable approach to space. Next slide, please. So I will end with this slide um, and I'm not gonna read out all of these points, but I wanna emphasize that our goal is to begin together. We want to invest in relationships and not rush to conclusions. And this is really the beginning of a long overdue conversation on our shared skies and preserving the skies and space as a scientific, environmental, and cultural commons for humanity and really all ecological systems. Some themes that emerged from our reports are more international regulation and globally coordinated oversight and enforcement, and Richard will almost certainly be um, amplifying that. And some of the presentations you've already heard today have emphasized the value of learning from other industries and learning from the past. As we move forward in assessing the environmental, economic, and infrastructure trade-offs in what's unfolding in low Earth orbits. I mean, are we getting the uh, affordable global broadband we were promised, uh, because there's a lot of economic and environmental and infrastructure implications. I want <clears throat> to emphasize uh, one point that really came out of some of our reports, which is to avoid binary thinking in our community. 
let's not pit the need of astronomers against the real dire need uh, for global affordable broadband. Let's not pit science versus culture, something we're already doing with uh, telescopes on indigenous lands. Let's not discuss Earth versus space as separate environments. It's all a continuum. It always has been. And we learn and grow stronger by developing integrative approaches from all human ways of knowing. Uh, for example, if we could establish a Office of Indigenous Affairs at NASA so that we can move forward together uh, with science rooted in cultural competency, sustainability, and relationships. I will end here. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks to Aparna for that. And it is a natural lead in to say, how do we move more formally to protect the interests, not only of cultural practitioners, but of amateur and professional astronomers. So a new function of this LP RISD commission is to set up what they're calling a policy working group. And AAS is complicated, of course. So we'll have to talk about that relationship. I will be co-chairing this group with Charles Mudd, who is an amazing expert in space law, so that we have, we have that additional dimension. And since this is a AAS function, we have to be complementary to the international efforts because we're very interested in the US, both for satellite constellations and for facilitating the ecosystem of, of local interested parties, as James talked about, working on their protection of their dark skies. So what are the objectives of this policy group? Um, well, first of all, you've heard there are spectacular documents now, both from the Satellite Constellations workshop, workshops supported by the National Science Foundation and by the UNIAU supported dark and quiet skies workshops, they lay out a set of principles. Um, formally, it would be spectacular for the AAS to endorse those principles. So that's step one. Um, we know that traditionally and for the longest time, AAS has had amazing staff. And so right now, Julie Davis is our Bacall Public Policy Fellow, and there's a search underway for Joel Perriott's replacement as permanent staff, and so we, we need to work and support those people for our contacts um, with government agencies. So we want to develop and advocate for policy and regulatory changes at both agencies and in statutory law to mitigate these impacts. In other words, and Step one in this process is that we are trying to cooperate with industry to formulate best practices that they will actually do. Then we wanna codify those good intentions. And so we really would, oh, excellent. And Paula says the board already has that official endorsement. So, so step one is in hand. So we wanna make, um, um, yes. So everybody agrees we've got that endorsement. So, so we are operating in that framework. Um, we want to make mitigation of these impacts a condition of licensing for laws and operations, and that can be done both through law or through policy change within agencies. Um, as, as Aparna said, um, coordination matters, consultation matters, but there is a process uh, that Harvey mentioned where there are coordination agreements with impacted agencies. That's how the ITU regulatory protection of astronomy is instituted. We now have issues, as you heard, that for both OIR and for um, radio beyond frequency management that also need consideration. And so we could extend the concept of coordination agreements with agencies to include these broader issues. We note that the Council on Environmental Quality within the White House has open seats, and that's a natural place to interact with OSTP and others to establish an environmental framework to consider orbital operations. Um, and so, you know, this, this is a multi-pronged approach. 
we want to advocate for consideration of aggregate impacts. There are space traffic issues. This is a frightening prospect. So next slide. More, more objectives. We want to have policies available as a model so that we can look at what other countries are doing. We want, as James said, there are these great recommendations for how to proceed um, on local regulation for ground-based light pollution control. We also want to coordinate with that. Um, IDA is the go-to, just as we said. So we want to be able to send double, interested AAS members that direction. Um, there are some issues. The OIR part is not nearly as well posed as the many tens of years of negotiation about radio frequency. And so the industry is looking for some clearer guidance than our rough benchmark so far. So we will need to work together as a community to provide those. And that's that, that is that final bullet. And we also want our elevator speeches to be very crisp. What is the impact on our field? What are agency priorities that are getting impacted? Next slide. So who can be part of this? Short answer, we need all the help we can get with this. So all interested existing members of this committee working on this, we need crossover because AAS has a structure that already addresses public policy more generally. But as you can see from the explosion of activity, particularly in the SATCON area, we need a, a, a dedicated group for that that then interacts with the general public policy um, determinations. Um, <laughs> we have great intentions about a website. That's real work. So we need some volunteers. And then we're going to encourage people who go on like the um, um, Congressional Visits Day. If you're really interested in policy, here's a way that we can focus our efforts where it's really needed right now. So we'll encourage a broad participation. Thanks. Hello, I think I'm the next speaker. My name is Connie Walker. And I am a scientist at your national observatory in the US named NSF's Noir Lab. Um, I'm glad to be here with you all. Uh, today, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the international center that's been created for uh, the protection of the dark and quiet sky from satellite constellation interference. And, um, and to begin with, um, I just want to bring you back to May of 2019, after the first Starlinks that were launched. Astronomers with experts in space policy, satellite industry, and the general community spent about two years conducting research, organizing two workshops that you've already heard about, namely SATCON 1 and SATCON 2, and two others that you heard about, uh, conferences, uh, Dark and Quiet Skies for Science and Society. And these were um, ex you know, also published with extensive reports. Um, the idea of creating a center to continue the efforts to mitigate the impact of satellite constellations on astronomy originated during SATCON 2 and has its foundations in all four of those workshops and conferences. And as a result, on April 1st, the International Astronomical Union, sort of the overlord of all these associations throughout the world, with 12,000 members of astronomers, um, they're going to they're going to open a center, uh, such a center that I've mentioned, and it's going to be called the IAU CPS to shorten the title, and will officially start on on April 1st. So let me just mention a few uh, terms of the. Um, mission of, of the center. So the center is going to coordinate uh, global efforts to converge on mitigation solutions and also bring together astronomers, uh, as I said before, people like in industry and policy experts and the wider community, and act as a bridge between all stakeholders. And the center is going to produce and disseminate um, open source information and resources for anyone to use. And uh, we'll and also continue to uh, do research or, or help do research on satellite constellation issues to arrive at feasible and implementable solutions um, in the areas uh, shown here. And these four areas we're gonna to touch on in the next, the next slide, so Julie. 
Okay, so the activities of the center will be conducted by collaboration in four key areas we call hubs. And the first is SatHub, which will coordinate, develop, and share software to both remove satellite streaks and to predict the paths and the timing of satellite crossings to allow observatories and observers to plan their observing programs. The second is uh, an industry hub, which will engage with the satellite companies to support measures that reduce the brightness of satellites and their impact on astronomy and improve astronomers' ability to predict locations. Um, the third is a policy hub, which will, stay, uh, which will stay coordinated with various groups that are working with the government and commercial stakeholders who will draft and implement regulations. And then the fourth area is a community engagement hub, which invites people within various communities to voice their viewpoints, as Aprana so eloquently uh, had described. And the, the, um, the hub will eventually offer uh, also a website and workshops and discussion forums and social media with which to do this. Next slide, please. So there is an organization chart here <laughs> for the IE Center. Uh, the director of the center is Piero Benvenuti. He's a past general secretary of the, of the IEU, and he will liaise with the um, government, uh, governance board who provides oversight, and as well as the International Astronomical Union, Executive Committee, the United Nations, and various funding agencies, because we will need to get funding. Uh, the governance board is made up of two leaders from IEU, uh, two from Noir Lab and two from SKAO, which is the Square Kilometer Array Observatory, the radio side of things. Um, there's two co-directors, myself um, and Federico De Bruno from the Square Kilometer Array Observatory. So we, we represent the optical and infrared, uh, optical and radio side of things. And we will oversee um, the aforementioned four core areas or hubs of the you know, set hub policy industry technology uh, and technology and the community engagement hubs and we'll work with their leads and their respective working groups and the hub uh, leads have been identified in three of the four hubs and the working groups uh, have yet to be formed <laughs> um, the area shown in blue is the management team and consists of the director and you know the two co-directors uh, the management team will also be able to consult with an advisory board, and we have yet to form that, but that'll be 10 members who are experts in different areas um, and uh, uh, to, you know, different areas that help with the issues and mitigations of the impact of satellite constellations. Um, and then we have contributing and affiliated members, and that's going to be described on the next slide. Next slide, please. So connected to the center, we will have contributing members who will collaborate under a, an agreed work plan and provide resources. But those resources can be staff time and computing resources, for instance, and perhaps some will be monetary. <clears throat> and we'll also have affiliated members who will uh, work on a best effort basis. Uh, the center will be launched uh, on April 1st. The website will be available that week and called um, cps.iau.org. Uh, the details will be included, uh, will include providing a form with which the, uh, anyone can uh, apply to be either a contributing or affiliated member. And if you'd like to be considered for a working group as well, under one of the hubs I mentioned, um, uh, we'll name the hub leads and you'll be able to contact them and, and inter inter interact with them and to see if uh, there's membership available. Um, next slide, please. Julie? Yep. Thank you, Connie. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Julie Davis, and I am the Bacall Public Policy Fellow here at AAS. And I first want to thank um, all of the LP RISD members because they have done a lot of heavy lifting on all of these issues. Uh, and as such, we could really use your help. Um, AAS members and non-members all can go and talk to your Congress members or local government in the case of light pollution. Um, but we would like to urge you to do so and participate in advocacy and empower you. Uh, I'd like to say your Congress members want to hear from you. Um, I think we as scientists like to kind of sit on the sidelines and watch politics, but with stuff like this that actively affects our science, we have a duty to get involved. Uh, when you go to your Congress members, specifically about SATCONs, um, we have an example of a message that you can take. Uh, as was mentioned before, you wanna keep things simple and precise. Uh, 
For this issue, we would like to emphasize that mitigation of harm to astronomy needs to be a condition of licensing for launch and operations. And we also need financial support to continue to address the harms to astronomical data. Uh, if you go and talk to your congressional members, you can also advocate for expanding fiber internet as an alternative for broadband access. Uh, you can comment on regulatory and FCC filings. And most important, please include these issues in your outreach and course materials. The more people we can reach, the better. Now, uh, to find your Congress members, I've dropped a quick link in here and a few brief notes on how best to go about talking to your members. Uh, but I want to note before I get into that, that we have all of this and much more at aas.org slash advocacy. There you can find many resources, including example phone call scripts and uh, messaging tips and all sorts of great stuff. Now, uh, if you do go and contact your members of Congress about this issue or any other issue, you should first and foremost only contact your member of Congress. That is where you have the actual power because your vote matters to them. If your member is on a relevant committee, such as like a science and technology committee, especially the budget or appropriations committees, it is especially important for you to reach out because they have power to actually affect your issue. You should contact your member even if they disagree with you, if they're on the opposite side of the political spectrum. If they never hear from someone who disagrees, then how do they know that a dissenting opinion exists? And for those non-citizen scientists working here in the US, you can still contact your representative. However, effectiveness can vary based on the office. If you're going to meet with your Congress member, visiting in person is by far the most effective. You can schedule 15 minute meetings and go and have a chat with a staffer or if you're very lucky, the member themselves. And these can be incredibly impactful. Use this opportunity to tell them your story be specific, brief, and timely, and be sure that you avoid jargon or giving a technical presentation. <laughs> you know, go in and be sincere and tell them why this issue matters to you. You can also call on the phone and email, although these can be slightly less effective than an in-person visit. Uh, all communication is important though. The more they hear about these issues, the better. And again, visit AAS.org for more resources. And with that, I will hand off to the rest of our LP RISD team to explain in a little more detail some advocacy points for you to share. Okay, it looks like I'm back again. <laughs> um, all right, sorry, um, lost my place here. Um, I wanna mention that uh, again, as you said before, during the last two years, we had a astronomers, including members of LPRISD, which is the Light Pollution and Radio Interference and Space Debris Committee of the AAS. They've taken steps to first identify the issues and then formulate recommendations toward mitigation. And uh, these were the goals of the national, uh, the NSF-funded uh, SACCON 1 workshop and of the Satellite Constellation Working Group that was part of the Dark and Quiet Skies workshop, both in 2020. And the Dark and Quiet Skies Workshop was um, organized by the UN, uh, by the IU, and by uh, Spain, actually. And in 2021, the goal of SETCON 2 um, and the satellite constellation working group, again, of, of Dark and Quiet Skies 2 was to identify pathways to implement these recommendations. And we also took the opportunity to strengthen uh, the conversation with industry to engage a considerably wider group of stakeholders in uh, conversations that have been pre present in SACON 1 and 2, and to explore uh, existing policy frameworks and uh, generating ideas for the development of policies um, uh, that, were, that are basically capable of addressing an entirely new era in the exploration of, uh, and use of space. So um, reports for all of these workshops and conferences are listed um, under the images that you see here. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, worth, it's worth reading. <laughs> um, but last but not least, we're continuing our efforts uh, through the International um, Center that I mentioned before on the protection of dark and white skies from satellite constellation interference. Jeff? Yeah, next slide, Julie. Um, there were questions um, earlier in the session about whether uh, this is going to be 
recorded? And the answer is yes, we're recording this and uh, the slides will be available. So we wanted to provide a, a synopsis of some of these recommendations so that everybody has the same talking points. So here's, uh, we'll just scroll quickly through the key findings from SATCON 1. Julie, if we can just scroll through these. Um, Richard, uh, or someone mentioned the, uh, the seventh magnitude limit. Um, so on these slides, we're giving what the key recommendations were and a bit of the rationale. So this is where the crosstalk images and Rubin images become uh, tractable to software, although that's not an easy problem. We want the, the operators to fly low because that limits the optical visibility substantially. Next. Um, fast orbit rays, because when they're in their park orbit, parking orbits to process to the desired orbital plane, uh, they're quite a bit brighter. So we're encouraging the operators to raise them quickly and to operate on knife edge rather than open book mode. We need much more improved positional me uh, measurements than the industry presently provides for its own purposes. And, and for SATCON 2, which was in July 2021, this, this really led to the, the formation of the center that Connie told you about. So Julie, just uh, let's see, um, we'll create SATHUB. That was one of the recommendations. Um, we have an enormous uh, mandate uh, to develop comprehensive and consistent software tools so that the removal and masking of trails is not done in a way that is consistent and believable uh, by the community. Next. Um, Aparna talked about the need to bring all the voices to the table. This goes well beyond industry and astronomy. Next. And really, um, I'll come back to this in just a moment after Connie talks about dark and quiet skies, <clears throat> but we, we desperately need to update policy. I saw a question go by asking about regulation. There's very little, it's a wild west up there, and we really need to get, get uh, frameworks in place to, to govern the rules of the road in Leo. So over to you, Connie. Okay, then next slide. Yeah, there you go. Okay, so um, I just want to mention some key accomplishments with respect to our Dark and Quiet Skies 1 and 2. Um, to be honest, the SACON Working Group uh, report extends uh, extended results from the groundwork uh, laid um, by SACON 1. So in the Dark and Quiet Skies 1, we just extended things further, much of the same things that um, that, uh, that Jeff had mentioned. And this is, uh, and it was also reported out to the UN, which is the very important thing to, to note. That was uh, reported out to the UN Committee for the Peaceful Use of Outer Space, uh, their Science and Technology Committee. And um, this hopefully gets to their delegates. The so delegates recognize this and, uh, and start accepting more of what we're saying and take it back to their own country, especially those countries that have, um, that have active uh, space industries. Um, and then for SETCON 2, which happened in October 2021. Um, the Satellite Constellation Working Group of, of SECON, uh, of Dark and Quiet Skies 2, I should say, uh, that report extended results from the groundwork laid by SECON 2. And so I won't go too much into that. Um, it had um, working groups on national policy, international policy observatories and industry. Uh, I think we have to go down to the next line. And then uh, and a deep dive into national and international policy as well. Um, with the SS help and industry's help, they created best practices, guidelines to mitigate impacts. And then next, um, reported out to the UN, as I mentioned, um, in their science and technology subcommittee. And in that year, we really gained a lot of traction. And there were 25 UN delegates from different countries that basically signed on. Um, and then uh, uh, next, uh, we, we were invited to actually hold a symposium, which is only one is awarded per uh, uh, meeting. And uh, this was uh, for industry and astronomers during the science and technology subcommittee, very successful. And invite, we're invited back to STSC 2023 um, and have our own agenda item, which is very hard to get, to get one, uh, just dedicated to dark and quiet skies. Um, and um, the last line is on, on the foundation of all four workshops. Again, the IU Center has been established. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, and last slide, and then we will go to um, the Q&A. Um, and this is just, uh, I, I'm amplifying, I think, somewhat what Julie said in terms of, of talking points and tools for advocating 
for, for all of these issues. So uh, Richard Green uh, is down in Tucson. I'm, I'm up in Flagstaff and we've had a lot of traffic with the Arizona legislature on ground-based light pollution issues, particularly involving proliferations of electronic billboards, which are tremendously uh, light polluting. Um, for, for this, and, and I think critically for the SATCON issue, um, progress is likely to come through legislation and policy. Um, and therefore, we have an obligation to be communicating, as Julie said, with our elected officials. And every one of us is an ambassador for the field. So this is just a, a one or two minutes of personal reflection on my experiences with legislators on all sides of the aisle at, at the state and sometimes federal level. Next, Julie. Um, Julie already said this. They really want to hear from you, whether they agree with you or not. Um, they and they, they like to hear from you. They want to speak with their constituents. You know, we. We often get a dim view of elected officials through the filter of the media. I fully concede there are perhaps a few personalities that should not be in positions of authority, but by and large, um, they really are interested in hear from you and in hearing from you and want you to come talk with them. Next. Um, it's really important to engage with state as well as federal. You know, your, your local state representative may be in a district that has a major corporation that lands a big contract to build parts for a satellite company. So they need this as well as the federal electeds who can set national policy. Next. Um, absolutely, can't agree more with Julie, meet in person. And this is, you know, if you're at the University of Delaware, it's easier to get to Dover than it is if you're at JPL and need to get to Sacramento. We understand this, but, um, you know, they do come to their home districts and if at all possible meet for meet in person and their schedules are insane. So keep your points focused to the point and, and don't take more of their time than, than necessary. Next, um, straightforward, non-technical, no sarcasm, no ultimatums. Uh, Aparna kind of alluded to this. We can't be taking our way or the highway sort of approach. They need to understand the nuances of the issues. Next, Julie. Um, that I, I've heard uh, occasional remarks at AAS, oh, I don't speak, legislators speak. It's, it's just a normal conversation. You're talking with regular people who have a hundred different voices in their ear and by and large, uh, whatever side of the aisle they're on, trying to make uh, good decisions. And my experience here in Arizona is whether or not legislators agreed or voted with astronomy on billboard issues, uh, they wanted to hear from us and were really interested in hearing what the impacts on, on the nearby observatories were. Next. Um, don't, don't give them lines in the sand. Uh, you know, nothing is, as Aparna has said, everything is interrelated. And, and the more we give them nuanced views and, and help them understand all of the competing issues, the more reasonable decisions they'll be able to make. And I think that's my last point. If you, um, um, oh yeah, that, this is the last point. Thank them. Um, if you, I, in the, the occasions I've sent a, a legislator an email that finishes with, thank you for your service to Flagstaff, Arizona, whatever, often you get an astonished reply. Uh, you can imagine what their inboxes look like and a little kindness sometimes goes a long way. Okay, and now I think we can go to the questions. Yes, and so I'm gonna turn it over now to Meredith Rawls uh, from the University of Washington um, to manage the questions. Uh, Meredith, take it away. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you everyone for attending today. Um, there are a couple of questions about um, slide and recording availability. Um, and just to kind of address all at once, um, I believe we do intend to make the slides and the recording from this webinar available uh, somewhere on the AAS website. Um, and we will send an email out to all of the participants uh, once we have that information, since we got your contact information when you signed up. Um, so I don't have that URL for you now, uh, but we will get that turned around as soon as we can. So thank you for those questions. Um, we have about 20 minutes um, for questions. If you have a question, you can type it in the Zoom Q&A tool. Um, I probably won't get to every single one of them. If you have a particular person in mind to answer your question, bonus points if you indicate that. So without further ado, um, uh, let me start off with a question that came in from uh, Lucy McFadden, which is, what is the nature of communications with SpaceX and OneWeb? What do they say about the effect of their satellites on ground-based observing and near space operations? Is this field inadequately regulated? And if yes, how does the policy get developed? 
if you're a panelist person who spoke today and be willing to turn your camera on, then I might be able to give you a meaningful glance. <laughs> who would like to take this one? I could start by dint of the fact that I chaired the SATCON2 policy workshop and we had an industry subgroup in which those two companies participated. And so SpaceX um, was one of the first that actually jumped in and worked with Tony Tyson um, when their early launch alerted us to these issues. And their unshielded satellites were very bright. And so we're clearly going to be terrible saturation problems for all concerned. Um, they, um, they put on a sunshade. It cost them about 20 kilograms and it actually cut the, bag the brightness down by what you saw from what, what Pat showed you in his, his brightness graph from an innate four and a half to five to an innate six to six and a half magnitude. So it, it started down that path. OneWeb participated similarly. They are also in words saying that they are very committed. They know the problem. They are committed to trying to work it out. The product of Connie's Dark and Quiet Skies 2 workshop from the industry point of view was an initial document that has best practices in it that says, this is what we're going to try to do to mitigate these problems. There are three or four companies that are committed to that and the ongoing industry hub in the IAU center is intended to pull in the other dozen or so who have stated interest in world around the world for having these constellations. So yes, there ought to be a law. There is not one at the moment. We would like to put that best practices document into legislation in each of these countries to require people to get faint. So that's my comment. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, Aparna, jump in. Thank you, Richard. Um, I, I think we've all been very grateful for the voluntary uh, help uh, from and engagement from industry. And as Richard pointed out, it would be great to actually codify it and bring it into something formal. I We have such a great group of people here and I wanted to invite Meredith or Harvey to comment on something we are uh, learning as we go along, um, which is that, uh, one, one band passes mitigating solutions may become another band passes problem. Uh, so, you know, shields can sometimes radiate, uh, you know, at infrared and other wavelengths. I don't know if people want to comment on that. And that's something we will, we will all learn as we go along. Arvita, do you want to comment on that? Um, no, I think I think at the moment the problems are all flowing in one direction, right? We have this perverse situation where radio spectrum regulators who only care about spectrum allocations are authorizing satellite constellations that cause the uh, the problems that we've been discussing today. Sarah, and I can just briefly add that um, th there have been kind of one-off communications with um, various uh, engineers working at uh, several different satellite companies who have um, collaborated with astronomers um, to see how bright their satellites are and things like that. Um, so they're aware of the problem, right? But, um, but we are still working towards kind of a more um, broad way to address this. Um, I'm gonna let Charles comment and then we're gonna go to another question. I just have one very quick comment and that depending on the company, you get a different perspective on whether or not it's adequately regulated or not. There are some companies, and in fact, Richard was on a panel at Satellite 2022, um, where one company in particular thought that we're good, self-governance is fine and regulation should stay out of the way. I think that's the minority view, uh, but it does depend on the company that you ask. That's just what I wanted to add. Yeah, thank you. All right, let's go to a next question, which is technically not a question, but I'm going to allow it. Um, and this is uh, uh, Mark Skinner has offered um, 
uh, to just to briefly uh, address an issue under discussion with the Aerospace Corporation that supports the Department of Commerce under the Space Commerce Office um, regarding using accurate data on LEO satellite tracking um, to predict how it's going to affect astronomy. Um, is one of our hosts able to promote Mark Skinner to speaking permissions, please, just for a few minutes? Uh, I saw him briefly, and then he went away. There he is. So, Mark, if you can unmute and talk for just a couple moments, uh, there you are. Yeah. That would be that would be fine. Thank you. There is some magic there going on with Zoom. Um, like I said, uh, I'm at the Aerospace Corporation. My background is X-ray, gamma ray, and thermal infrared astronomy. Uh, like Pat, I've spent a lot of time looking at satellites and space debris, uh, mostly from Maui when I lived out there. Um, so. The Aerospace Corporation and my group is in particular are supporting the Department of Commerce, Office of Space Commerce, and standing up the so-called Open Architecture Data Repository, which per Space Policy Directive 3 is taking over the, um, the safety mission from the, uh, from the 18th Space Control Squadron. Uh, what this means is that we are going to have access to um, the most accurate data uh, available, both from the Space Surveillance Network plus uh, satellite uh, owner-operator ephemeris on their own satellites, plus commercial data that we'll be, collect, that we'll be paying for and collecting, plus any contributed data. Um, what we are trying to do is to, uh, it's under discussion at aerospace, is to marry this most accurate data of predictions of satellites passing over uh, ground-based or even space-based observatories, married with, um, a, to start with, a simple albedo model or a side lobe model for um, radio observatories to predict uh, when um, and where in the sky these satellites would be passing over your, your observatory. I think this could offer two different uh, benefits to ground-based observatories. It can help you planning your, um, planning your uh, observations. So it fits in what Connie was saying about the sat hub. Uh, and we would say publish out uh, uh, predicted satellite ephemeris in some, some time period in advance. And uh, that would help you with shutter control as well as where in the sky to steer your beam. And of course, if things really, uh, really go south, this gives you some uh, third party independent confirmation about who, you know, what the impact is on your observatory, um, which may be useful to you when you do outreach to your political, um, your political folks. So uh, uh, I'll just leave it at that. This is, you know, this is something we want, it, we want to make happen and we want to work with observatories uh, to take those, uh, once we get them going, to take those simple models and uh, maybe enhance them so that they reflect more accurately what uh, what is being sensed on the ground, um, because not everything is you know is a square meter, thirty percent reflective, blah blah blah. So uh, I'll leave it there, and if anybody has any discussion or questions, I'd be happy to happy to follow up a little bit. Thank you. Mark, really appreciate knowing about that. Um, Connie, it looks like you have a follow-up question to that. Yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, Mark, if you start with you, Meredith and I will be in contact with you next week, perhaps. Perfect. I'm in. I'm actually in Paris this week for the IAC Abstract Selection. But uh, when I get back to the office, we'll uh, we'll we'll touch base. Thank you. Yeah, we'd love to connect more about that. Thank you very much. All right, let's uh, go on to the next question. Um, I'm going, if, if y'all want to vote for your favorite questions, uh, I, I am going to go from the popularist down. So feel free to weigh in. Uh, panelists, I know that you don't get to vote, but that's just the way of things. Um, this is from an anonymous attendee who asks that there is one serious issue. While we keep organizing more to oppose the serious situation caused by these satellite companies, they keep continuing to launch satellites. How could we legally enforce them at this point to pause their plans until official serious discussions begin between them and the various concerned communities, at least in the US? Anyone want to take that one? Yes, by all means, Aparna. Well, I'll get us going because this is such a, a rich landscape of, I can't call them answers, but just responses. Uh, Speaking for myself, uh, there is certainly a power and dollar gradient uh, going one way. Um, and the question is, what can we do? It's impractical to suggest uh, all launches seize plus the satellites 
may serve many global needs uh, in scientific experiments and monitoring and health and climate, you know, monitoring and so on. So it's, for me, one issue I'd like to amplify from the work this committee has done is really ways to assess the, um, the impact. And as many have said already, working that codifying that into part of the structural system in which industry is operating right now. I think a, a very complex dialogue came up in these workshops around NEPA, uh, the National Environmental Protection Act. And maybe Richard can amplify the policy working groups, many views on that, like whether to start from what's established law or to try to work in NEPA, because right now the launches are operating under a NEPA exemption. And so there isn't any environmental assessment happening in a systematic and meaningful way. Uh, and again, this comes back to space is not yet declared an environment, uh, but of course it is, uh, speaking for myself. So again, um, I will leave it there because I see other hands up, but I think one way to get things to slow down so that people can listen and develop more slowly um, is to advance the policy and legal landscape. Thank you, Aparna. I think you're spot on. Uh, James, did you want to briefly add to that? Yes, the International Dark Sky Association did actually uh, call for a pause to launches. Uh, the AAS has not done that yet. The, I, uh, the IAU has a, a somewhat more um, concerned approach than, than AAS has uh, publicly expressed uh, sort of global opinion. But the short answer is no, we don't have any legal recourse to stop them. It's in the court of public opinion. And that's where you all, everybody on this call can play a role. Uh, what we need to do is make sure that our, our public decision makers understand the issue and they, they don't understand it unless you talk to them. Uh, sure, Richard, very briefly, please. It will be brief, but, but a part of toss the bait. And that is that, um, you know, we're working outward from our focus on the impact of astronomy on astronomy because we're the AAS. And so if we can start with the policy issues of, of the stray radiation of the sunlight and the radio, that's step one. And then as you saw what we laid out, you know, revitalizing the CEQ within the White House then starts us on the path to an environmental perspective that would be the, the longer term framework that's really needed here. So, so Step one is the practical policy implementation and parallel step 1B is, is starting to create that environmental look from the top down. Yeah, thank you, Richard. All right, the next question I have here is from Daniel Fisher with a similar theme, asking for the mega constellation, the night sky impact is kind of a side effect but for space mirrors or other similar proposals of bright orbital art or billboard type satellites, uh, it's actually their primary mission. Um, as Pat mentioned, these ideas go back a hundred some odd years. Why are there no clear international regulations for these kinds of projects? I don't know, Pat, did you have any, is Pat still? Yeah, Pat, did you have any thoughts on this? Uh, well, I wish there were, but there are no international regulations or guidelines on the brightness of anything in space. So, um, and I would have to toss this over to Richard. You know, I, it, these things, these bright objects, mirrors or solar power systems have incredible ecological effects as well, destroying uh, you know, your circadian rhythm and everything. And so I think they, they're at the point now where they need to be seriously considered in our discussions. And I turn it over to Richard for the um, policy issue. I agree and it, it, it is, we had hoped even in defining the IAU policy hub that this was going to be future look, but it's coming on us very fast. I think we don't want to be caught short as we were with the satellite constellation. So we're going to have to expand our purview in a hurry. Yeah, I agree with that completely. There, there's new stuff being proposed every day and we need to stay on top of that. Yeah, Jeff. 
Yeah, and, and to finish that answer for, for Daniel, I think part of the reason is this hasn't been a problem before. You know, uh, orbiting art and orbiting billboards has, has not been something that was accessible to, to the private sector until the past couple of years. And so this sudden change in, in technologies we've seen in many other instances in the past, our, our capabilities have exceeded and leapt past our, our our readiness to to regulate them. And so we're in uncharted waters and the window of opportunity to stay ahead of it is closing very fast. Yep, indeed. Uh, all right, uh, hopefully quick uh, question for Julie from Paula Scotti. Is there a current plan for meetings about this topic at the May congressional visit days? Uh, yes, we're definitely going to include this um, alongside the decadal priorities. At well, it is a decadal priority, so uh, we're definitely going to talk about it. Wonderful. And is there a place folks could go for more info on the congressional visit days, Julie? Um, do you want to put, maybe put the link in the chat or something, or maybe it's already in your slide? Uh, yeah, so the congressional visit day, the deadline to apply was at the end of February. Oh, okay. Uh, but for next year's congressional visit day, I can drop the link in the chat. Great, thank you. That, that's a really uh, wonderful way for AAS members to get involved um, in directly connecting with Congress members. All right, the next question we have is from Neil Tyson, uh, asking, please comment on the relative value of individual contact with representatives versus a more organized congressional hearing possibly covered by C-SPAN. Any thoughts there? Yeah, I can speak to that one. That sort of goes to, to my slide. You know, clearly getting in front of full congressional committees that can take action and move the needle is, is crucial. Uh, but if the faces testifying to those community committees have established a level of personal relationship through one-on-one -on -one meetings, I, I, that's been critical in our advocacy here in Arizona at the state level on things like billboard issues. Uh, so it, it's obviously not as as time effective, it, it takes time to build those relationships. But even if you are disagreeing with an elected, um, maybe you have agreed on one or two points and you're not just an anonymous face, but, but you're someone they know. I mean, eventually this is all about relationships and, and who you know, and, and it is vital for us to take the time to build those relationships with our electeds. And it makes the, it'll make the broader dis discussions uh, that much more effective. Yeah, I just quickly want to add that we definitely try to go both grass roots and grass tops in our advocacy. So uh, we are working with all the federal agencies and getting together with staffers and Congress members. Um, but we also want to have our, our membership fully engaged as well. So we're attacking from both sides. Yeah, thank you both. And and I think if you know if someone here has the ability to organize a congressional hearing, you know, certainly would be open to discussing that possibility. <laughs> certainly not off the table. All right, thank you, everyone. Um, all right, we have time for a couple more. This next one is from Rachel Atkinson. Uh, Rachel asks, is there a schedule for when SATCON resources like street detection software will be available? And unfortunately, I am gonna attempt to answer this one myself. So the 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 answer here is that uh, the new IAU center has these four different hubs, one of which we're calling SAT Hub, which is going to be the landing place for a lot of these observational coordination things. So, you know, if you have an image that has streaks in it, or if you have radio observations that have been affected by satellites, or if you want to learn how to analyze data like that, um, share software that you've worked on for mitigating it, things like this. This is what the, the SAT hub portion of the new IAU center is going to be for. That being said, the majority of the actual work of, to build these tools is going to need to be community driven. And so what that means, practically speaking, if, it, if, if you are interested in contributing to this, we absolutely want to hear from you. Um, uh, uh, Connie Walker is one of the uh, co-directors of this new center, and so she's a great person to get in touch with. Um, I'm spearheading the SAT Hub initiative, so you're also welcome to reach out to me. Um, and what we're really looking for is for contributing partners who want to go and, and apply for grants to work on individual pieces that are needed and then form collaborations like within the larger community. This is not something that there's a magic pot of money that we can uh, sprinkle upon you to solve, unfortunately, at this stage. Although if you have a giant pot of money and you would like to give it to us, we are listening. Um, I don't know if Jonathan or Connie or anyone would like to uh, to elaborate further on that. Yeah, I'm happy to uh, discuss with anyone who wants to contribute software. And we've got a couple of uh, 
uh, discussions already underway, but yeah, we're not we're not quite there yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say that the preliminary work that we have, well, that this these two people and their groups have done uh, in the past uh, through the workshops and conferences have been remarkable. Uh, we do need to extend that forward, and we do need the funding with which to do that. We have. Um, one grant we're going for now, we have um, a very meager amount, of, but we're grateful for the amount of money that the IU is, is kickstarting us with, uh, but we need, uh, we need future funding. So as Mary has said, if you wanna talk with us about that or in any capacity getting involved, we do need the person power to, to do the research and we'd be very happy to hear from you all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, uh, Connie, That's exactly right. All right, we are running out of time. Um, so I apologize if we did not get to your question yet. Um, I can spend a, a couple minutes uh, typing answers to the questions that remain, um, but I want to hand it back over to Jeff to um, give us an opportunity to close on time. Yep, we want to close on time to be respectful of everyone's time. So I will simply say on behalf of the entire committee, thank you for joining us. Um, we, as you can see, there is a lot to do. I um, want to thank uh, Julie and the AAS for, for supporting this workshop. The LPRASD members are a great group who bring uh, tremendous expertise, but there's lots to do. And we are always welcoming uh, expressions of interest in joining the committee. So if you'd like to uh, lend a hand on some of these important issues, please feel free. Um, this, as, as said, this will be uh, recorded and Julie's gonna have this on the AAS site as well as the slideshow. And we're available to answer any questions after the fact by, by email. We're always happy to provide whatever information you might need to advocate for the protection of the dark and quiet sky and the future of our field. So thank you for spending an hour and a half with us. We hope this has been use, useful and enjoyable for you. And all the best. Have a good weekend.